And now to present today's two o'clock program in the Hall of Philosophy, where this week we're focusing on the theme of with economic justice for all. Today's distinguished guest is John Hope Bryant, chairman and CEO of Operation Hope. A natural entrepreneur, life as a businessman for young John Hope Bryant began with the modest but life-changing $40 investment by his mother in his very first business idea. This was at the age of 10 in Compton, California. Mr. Bryan is today responsible for more than $1.5 billion of private capital supporting low wealth home ownership, small businesses, entrepreneurship, and community development investments through Operation Hope in underserved communities across the United States as well as investments in financial literacy programs and financial dignity education from South Africa to Morocco to Saudi Arabia. Author of Inc. Magazine CEO, Read Business Bestseller, Love Leadership. His book, Love Leadership, The New Way to Lead in a Fear-Based World, 2009, Bryant remained on the bestseller list for a total of 18 months, and today is the only best-selling business author in America who happens to be an African American. A Time Magazine 50 Leaders for the Future, and that was a cover story in 1994, some of you saw it, and an Oprah's Angel Network Award recipient, John Hope Bryant is a silver rights entrepreneur and businessman, an author, a thought leader, a philanthropist, and a founder, chairman, and chief executive officer of Operation Hope. He's been an advisor to the last three sitting U.S. presidents, and his work has been recognized by the last five U.S. presidents. Occasionally, I'd pick up a magazine or a newspaper and see John Hope Bryant in the White House with whichever president happened to occupy it at the time, and I thought to myself, gee, Presidents come and go, but John Hope Bryant remains <laughs> there in the White House. <laughs> We're delighted as well to welcome uh, his lovely wife and new wife, Natasha Bryant, who is herself an educator, an executive, and entrepreneur. And so, Natasha and John, we welcome you on your first visit to Chautauqua. The title of John Hope Bryant's lecture today is How the Poor Can Save Capitalism, Delivering the Memo to a New Generation of Leaders, which is also the title of his New York Times best-selling book. You will be pleased to know that Mr. Bryant will do a book signing on the porch of the Hall of Missions immediately after this lecture, and that his books will be sold in front of the Hall of Missions as well. We're most grateful to the Elizabeth Elser Doolittle, Doolittle Endowment Fund for adult pro programming for support of this week's lectures. So please join me now in extending a warm, warm Chautauqua welcome to John Hope Bryant. Good afternoon. Um, Dr. Franklin sort of gave me a promotion. Um, the, the, the book is not on the New York Times bestseller list yet, the new one. <laughs> but I'm glad that the Bible says there is no vision that people perish. I'm, I'm glad you, glad, it is, uh, uh, in, it's been out for a month. It is um, a bestseller on Apple's iBooks, top 10. It is a bestseller uh, on Amazon, uh, top 10. And, and as of yesterday, it became a CEO Reads business bestseller. And so we're now aiming, of course, for the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. Um, and to write this book and that nobody said could be written about a topic. I mean, imagine a young black dude from Compton, California in South Central LA with no economics degree, no philosophy degree, talking about a boring topic like financial literacy and money um, that sold out Amazon in the first 48 hours. <laughs> Um, and the book has only been out, out a month and it's, it's already on the bestseller list. You know, God can do anything. Um, 
and a belief in something larger and more important than yourself can transform America and transform our world. Uh, this is not a country, it's an idea. America's an idea, and we can make her whatever we want. There's a few people who've made her different and better. Uh, as Deepak Chopra would say, we're not human beings having a spiritual experience. We're spiritual beings having a human experience. And Dr. Robert Franklin, as they, say, where, as they used to say where I grew up in my neighborhood, is a bad brother. <laughs> now, you call him doctor, you call him professor, but we would just call you a bad brother. Um, is an amazing human being, and you are really fortunate to have him here uh, in this time, at this moment in history. And I'll talk about how important this moment in history is. There's some other heroes and sheroes in the room. Uh, Dr. Haleen Gale um, is uh, just one of my favorite people on the planet. Her, she, her family's been coming here uh, to Chautauqua for five generations, going back to 1930. You have my friend, Dr. Raphael, Warnock. Uh, he doesn't walk on water, but he knows where the stones are. <laughs> and even if he was a lousy preacher, he dresses really well. <laughs> Luckily, you get a twofer. Dr Raphael is dressed casual right now. He still looks good. He, he's, got, he's got on short pants and, and a t-shirt. He, he still looks good. Um, and tomorrow, you have my friend Tavis Smiley, uh, who will be with you in this same position, uh, and life's about relationships. You don't do business with government or countries or communities, you do business with people. Life's about relationships. We're going to get into that in a, a moment. But before I say anything further, let me just say, this, Chautauqua is just amazing. I mean, this is a, a very special place. And um, we got off the, you know, I, I do about 600,000 air miles a year, and so I thought i have seen sort of every environment, but you get off the freeway coming from uh, Buffalo and life changes. Everything slows down without going backwards, but it slows down. You know what I'm saying? It's not going backwards. It's, you're, you're in present time. It just slows down. And it slows you down. And it puts you into a different space and a different element and a different energy. And by the time you come through the gates here, you're transformed. You're uh, a different person. You're a better person when you leave. And that's energy. And you make all that energy. Uh, and you've created a culture and an environment here which can be transformational, and hopefully we are here to talk about that transformation uh, at scale uh, in this conversation. Chautauqua, um, as I understand it, actually stands for uh, two moccasins. And you've got, I guess, the physical embodiment of that if you're looking up uh, and looking down, that it actually looks like uh, two moccasins. But I, I have a different... Uh, take on that. And that's uh, the two moccasins represent uh, two feet of the same person. And to be disconnected from yourself is to be insane, or at the very least to be um, discombobulated. Certainly it's not, it's not sustainable. The conscious from the unconscious mind cannot exist for long. Black from white rich from poor, conservative from liberal, east from west, Abraham from all of his children. We're one world. We forget about that sometimes. It's our fear that causes us to differentiate and to focus, as Bill Clinton would say, on our uninteresting differences. So to me, this two moccasins tied together is perfect for this presentation today. So let me talk about how the poor can save capitalism. And first let me say and suggest that poverty is actually no mystery. There's a very good reason why we have poverty. Um, and it's this reason. There's about seven billion people on this planet, give or take. About five billion of them never got the memo. Imagine being at the place where you worked or once worked, where your children works, 
imagine you've got a nice title and auto pay on your paycheck and a nice corner office, but you never, for three months, you didn't get a memo in the corporation or the school district or the government office. You didn't, your email stopped working. You never get any emails. You never got any notices about meetings. You didn't go to any meetings. Uh, the, 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 the management and leadership talk, stopped talking to you. Just, just, just imagine now, just for three months, you've got a title, you've got a position, you actually have, a, you're, you're getting paid, you've got an offer. Question, are you engaged with that conversation? Are you help, can you lead? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm from the black church. I'm used to talking to you. And with, I'm, I'm actually talking to you. I'm, I'm, I actually want a response. You can say the amen for Warnock. Just give me a response. No, you can't. And I'm talking about just for three months. Just for three months. Imagine this. After the Civil War, President Lincoln, arguably one of the best presidents, if not the best president we've ever had in this country, signed the Emancipation Proclamation. We all know about that. And then Dr. Franklin, and I want to acknowledge your wife also, Dr. Franklin, doctor and doctor, uh, who's here hopefully somewhere, uh, who uh, epitomizes excellence as well. Imagine that the, the, the most important thing that Lincoln thought he could do after signing the Emancipation Proclamation on March 3rd, 1865, was to sign the Freedmen's Bureau Act. Now, there's some very smart people in this room, or under this dome, or wherever you happen to be sitting. But most people have no clue what I just said. He signed the Emancipation Proclamation. 99.9% .9 of people who are thoughtful know about that. And then the most important thing he thought he could do, March 3rd, 1865, was to sign the Freedmen's Bureau Act. The Freedmen's Bureau Act created the Freedmen's Bank. The Freedmen's Bank's mission was to teach freed slaves about money. Now, let me just let that sit with you for a minute. Because that just blew me away. Wait, 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 slow, slow down. As we say in my neighborhood, slow your roll. Wait a minute, you tell me that the most important thing that Lincoln thought he could do after physical freedom was to teach freed slaves about the free enterprise system and teach them the language of money. It's powerful. Imagine going to Japan and speaking advanced Spanish. <laughs> Imagine going to Korea and speaking advanced Russian. You're real smart, but can you do any business? Can you even communicate and get around? Not very well. There's a language to money. There's a language to free enterprise and capitalism. It's passed down almost part of the DNA of people who actually understand wealth. They do it almost unconsciously today. I'm going to leave the story and come back to it. Let me give you one example. We now know this organization as a program. It's called Junior Achievement. Familiar with Junior Achievement? Oh, that's a nice little program. Sweet, it's in school. No, 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 no. Think about the name. Created 100 years ago by agrarian farmers who wanted to teach their children how to run their business. Because in those small towns, in those small farms, and I thought about it as I was driving here through this, these rolling foothills and towns and with these small outposts of a few hundred, a few thousand people, and the school system taught you reading, writing, and so on, but it didn't teach import, export, finance, marketing, wholesale, retail, customer, it didn't teach those things. So the owners of enterprise, the agricultural age, the farm said, I need my child to be able to run this farm so they could take it over. So they created clubs of, of owners, you with me? And called it Junior Achievement. Well, 4-H is another example. But in this example, I'm, talk I'm the speaker. I talked about Junior. <laughs> you'll, you'll, you'll come along in time. Is, it's a participatory deal, but I'm the... Lead participant. In <laughs> you got that. So junior achievement was literally junior achievement. 
It was designed, it was a business purpose to it. It was clubs of owners. Now, that was just 100 years ago. Let's go back again to Lincoln's day and age. So Lincoln signed this bill that created this bank. Now, Washington, D.C. is all proximity to power. If you've been to Washington, you know the White House, right on Pennsylvania Avenue. What's to the left of White House in 1865, it was the Department of War. What is it now? The old executive office building, O-E-O-B. It's still there. What was to the right of the White House? Still there? Treasury Department. Correct. Is that incidental? No. Lincoln wanted to run over to the Department of War and strategize and give some directives, and he run over to the Treasury to pay for it and run back over to, I mean, it was, it was literally federal policy, war policy, economic policy, from one office to the next. So if something's important, you need it close. Where did he put the Freedmen's Bank? Was it in Virginia? No. Was it in Maryland? No. Was it across town in Washington, D.C.? No. No. If you know Washington, D.C., you know Pennsylvania Avenue, the Treasury Department's here. The White House is here. He put the Freedman's Bank here. If you know it today, it's Bank of America's building. You know that? You visualize it? It's where Bank of America is today. It used to be Riggs Bank. That facility, which is now also the Treasury Annex, literally across the street from the White House is where Lincoln put the Freedman's Bank. He wanted to go to bed in the residence at night, and before he went to bed, look out the window and see the candles burning. He wanted to know that somebody was working on what he thought was the most important thing that he could do after physical freedom. He was killed two weeks later. Now, a little backstory. One of his generals during the war had promised every freed slave 40 acres and a mule. It was really a strategy to, to get the slaves in the Confederate states to rebel against the Confederate army, but later on he said, you know, Lincoln, this is actually not such a bad idea. Maybe we should give them 40 acres and a mule. Lincoln said, it's not my policy, but I can get with that. He was killed two weeks later. Imagine if he had lived five more years. 40 acres and a mule for every freed slave. An understanding of the language of money, free enterprise, and capitalism. Access to capital. He was killed. Now, he had, you know, team of rivals. He had brought people in his cabinet who didn't necessarily agree with his positions. His vice president was actually a southern segregationist named Andrew Johnson. And when he was killed, Johnson took over. And Johnson said, and I quote, as long as I'm leading this government, it will be led by white men. He then tried to reverse everything that Lincoln did. The Congress and others said, no, 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 we won't have that. So Johnson did the next best thing. He said, I can ignore it. I can't change it, so I can ignore it. By the way, if you want to know, if you, want, if you ever wonder, for all you civil rights uh, leaders in here who were down with Dr. King and the movement, and you tried so hard to help, you wonder, how did we have local laws and local ordinances and state laws in direct conflict with federal law? That's the answer. That Johnson just said to the southern governors, I can't change these federal laws, but I can ignore them. Do as you like. Are you with me so far? This is a setup for where we're going, but I'm trying to frame the conversation. So Lincoln gets killed, Johnson takes over, uh, allows the bank to drift. The bank was known to be failing. It had 70,000 depositors at the height as it was failing. Can you imagine this? Former freed slaves who even though the way they were treated still believed in America, still believed in their constitution, still believed in their Bill of Rights, still believed in life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. This is an amazing American story. They put their money in this bank, and the bank was failing, and as it was failing, a man who lived not so far from here, you can't make this up, a man who lived not so far from here, my friend Andrew Young, my mentor, who, Ambassador Andrew Young, who spoke here, would say coincidence is God's way of staying anonymous. <laughs> he lived not so far from here. His name was Frederick Douglass, the Colin Powell of that day, maybe times 10, no disrespect to Colin Powell. He, he went in to run the bank, as it was failing, as the bank failed, he tried to save it. Then he just tried to make sure that it did as least damage as possible as it was failing. After it failed, he said the failure of this bank did more to set freed slaves back than 10 more years of slavery. I'd argue and add to that, set freed slaves back in America. Snap your fingers, 
and you fast forward 100 years. By the way, what happened 10 years after that bill? Chautauqua was created, 1874, by, yes, uh, people of the faith, but also some capitalist backers who were allowed to finance uh, this great uh, dream to build it, to help to build it up. So wealth uh, and people who understood wealth helped to create an environment where you don't have to worry about wealth creation at all. I'll get back to that uh, in a minute, but this is a beautiful thing that is an embodiment of what happens when you do it right. But 100 years passed, 1865, where are we? 1965. Who came on the, the scene in 1957? Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. There are other leaders, but I'm going to use him as a symbolic example of uh, this movement. And my hero, Andrew Young, Ambassador Young was his partner. What were they about? War, racism, and poverty. Remember, he, t he gave that I, great I Have a Dream speech with all, everybody, all, anybody seems to remember about Dr. King is, is one speech, I have a dream. But even that speech, was a, it, was, it was during the March for Jobs and Freedom. Did you, did you catch that? Jobs and Freedom. We forget the jobs part. In fact, even Dr. King said in the speech, I'm here in Washington to cash a check and march non-sufficient funds. Dr. King didn't want to get involved with the economic discussion early on because he was being called a communist, he was being called a socialist, and he was concerned that he mixed civil rights and civil rights legislation with an economic campaign that one would get blended with the other and, and he would forfeit the whole movement. So he decided to do it one at a time, the Civil Rights Act, which, of course, the 50th anniversary was yesterday, the Voting Rights Act. And then he had tackled the Vietnam War, and he had shifted in 68 to the Poor People's Campaign. Am I, are you with me? He took a sojourn over to Memphis. It wasn't planned. And he was killed April 4th, 1968, two weeks before his first march of the Poor People's Campaign in Washington, D.C. He never made it to his first march. By the way, this was the first part of the movement that was not about race. There are more poor white people in America than poor anybody else. And today, whether you're white, black, red, brown, or yellow, you want to see some more green. <laughs> Can I get an amen? Yeah. You deal with class, you get race for free. Well, I'm giving you guys some good stuff. It's going right over your heads. It's okay. It's all right. No problem. It's okay. King said in 68, you cannot legislate goodness and you, and you cannot pass a law to force someone to respect you. The only way to social justice in a capitalist country is economic ownership. That was Dr. King in 1968. This was a movement of all people and the reimagining of America and there are theories about why he was killed that are tied directly with that last part of his movement. My mentor, Ambassador Andrew Young, was told by the FBI that the instructions for the shooter was, if you miss Martin, get the strategist. My, my mentor can't even sleep. He's got survivor's remorse. He sleeps four hours a night. He just feels like his life is on borrowed time, that his money is, is not his money, that he's really just here because his friend was killed. He was mayor because his friend was killed. He was ambassador because his friend was killed. He, he's prosperous because his friend was killed. He feels like his life is really a life that is not his own. Rainbows after storms. It is a scientific fact that you cannot have a rainbow without a storm first. Look how beautiful it is right now. But it was just storming a little while ago. We can reimagine this country to be anything that we like. I'm coming home. Now, I know I'm boring you. I'm coming home. <laughs> Why did I tell you 151 years of history? By the way, Dr. King was killed in 68. Snap your fingers. Boom. You come up to today because literally nothing else has happened. And by the way, I, I've heard a lady's name uh, uh, when I, since I've been here, Marion Wright Edelman, Children's Defense Fund. If she hasn't spoken here, she needs to. The lady who, who, who whispered in the ear of Dr. King and said the next movement was about money, Martin, was Marion Wright Edelman. Her daughter, by the way, continuing the legacy, is a lady named Debbie Wright, who's Debbie Wright, CEO of Carver Federal Savings Bank. What's Carver Federal Savings Bank? The second largest black bank in America. You can't make this up. 
151 years. Boom. Here's why I'm optimistic. It's not like we got the memo and we screwed it up. We never got the memo. Did you get that? I don't know about you. That, that should actually make you optimistic. It should actually make you feel good. People not waking up in the morning and said, oh, let me be broke. <laughs> let me be poor and ignorant. Let me be stupid. Let me, let me go into some deep, uncomfortable waters. Because I thought I understood poverty. Because I'm, you know, if you haven't noticed, I'm black. <laughs> I grew up in South Central LA in Compton, California. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story. But I actually thought, Dr. Franklin, that I was poor. I now realize I wasn't. There's a difference between being broke and being poor. To be broke is economic, but to be poor is a disabling frame of mind and a depressed condition of your spirit, and you must vow never, ever, ever to be poor again. Yeah. I was talking to Dr. Franklin and others, and, we, and there was an experiment that he was telling me about, about some gentlemen who were very well-meaning, they're going out hanging out with homeless people to try to, uh, you know, relate to their experience. And they dress like them, they act like them, they walk like them, they talk like them, they live like them. But the legitimate people who were homeless knew that these were instigators. They knew that they were not homeless. Why? The twinkle was still in their eye. The hope was still in their eyes. I can give a homeless guy a million dollars, he'll be broke in six months with the best of intentions, because nothing changed here and here. The word capital comes from the Latin root word capitas. It means knowledge in the head. It doesn't even mean money. Back to the story. You thought I got distra distracted, didn't you? <laughs> when you think about the so-called poor, and by the way, welfare was actually created, food stamps was created for white Americans, not black Americans. I've already said there's more poor whites in America than poor anybody else. We really are all in this mess together. But when you think about, I'm talking about this traditional poverty, I'm talking about and I'm talking about uh, non-traditional uh, poverty, which is going to blow your mind. Traditional poverty is the easy one. Think about black urban poverty. Let's think about young people in the inner city. These kids, I'll say it, overwhelmingly want to be rap stars, athletes, and drug dealers. I used to believe these kids were dumb and they were stupid. And I grew up in this community. Now I know they are not. They are brilliant because they are modeling what they see. Everybody's aspirational. Everybody wants to be successful. Why am I a businessman? I'm not a rocket science or a genius. My daddy was. I'm just role modeling. Why are you come here? Somebody you loved came here. They told you about it. Why do you feel good about yourself? Somebody that you grew up with and parent felt good about themselves. You modeled that. Watch how you live your life. It may be the only Bible that anybody else reads. If you go into an inner city neighborhood and all you see is symbols of success and prosperity, hold on, are rap stars, athletes, and drug dealers, then why is anybody surprised that that's what people want to be? We're modeling what we see. The book, The Tipping Point, Malcolm Gladwell, proved that it's 5% role models, University of Illinois study, 5% role models, every community stabilizes. I didn't say 80% role models. I didn't say 50% role models. I didn't say 20. I didn't even say 10. Hope is so powerful. You only need 5% of it to change the world. 5%. There's nobody, I'm wearing a suit intentionally today. There's nobody in these neighborhoods wearing suits. Quincy Jones says it takes 20 years to change a culture. In the last 20 years, we've made dumb sexy. We've dumbed down and celebrated it. And we have got to make smart sexy again. The guy who made this suit and the shirt I'm wearing came to Operation Hope, the organization I founded, 
And he said, I want to be a, a clothier. I want to go work for a designer. I said, sir, we don't have, you don't have those relationships. They don't know you. This world works on relationships. I'm sorry to tell you that you can be competent, but you've got to have a relationship to power, to influence and so he ignored me and said, oh, I just, you know, I said, you should be a small, be, be a small business owner, become a clothier. He said, okay, great, I just need a loan. I said, that's not capital. I just told you capital is knowledge in the head. Look, I don't need your advice. I need some money. <laughs> it's a, look, it's a free country. If you want to set yourself on fire, that's okay. I gave him a $10,000 loan. He went to Las Vegas to a clothing convention. They took his money. He came back a week later and said, okay, now I'll listen. <laughs> it's funny how that works, isn't it? I said, that's right. You can listen, but you've got to pay the $10,000 back. So we put him through a financial literacy course, put him through an entrepreneurship course, threw him through, put, put him through uh, financial case management. We raised credit scores at Operation Hope 120 points over 24 months. Nothing changes your life more than God or love than moving your credit score 120 points. <laughs> Hello? Little side note, you go to a neighborhood that we care about, low-wealth neighborhood, neighborhoods that maybe you marched in, that you're concerned about, that haven't changed in 50 years, maybe even got it, gotten worse. And here's what you see. A check casher next to a payday loan lender, next to a rent-to-own store, next to a title lender, next to, a, hold on, a renting rim store. You know, these 20-inch rims with spinners on the cars? They're renting rims now. I'm serious. Next to a liquor store. By the way, black communities, poor rural white communities outside of uh, military bases. I'm, these are, these are, these are, they're everywhere. Ladies and gentlemen, that's not racism. It's not even discrimination. It's target marketing. <laughs> they're literally targeting a 500 credit score. Poor people spend $89 billion a year on alternative financial service fees. That's $40,000 per person in their working life. So those who make the least pay the most and have no clue it's even happening. They actually think that this is normal because people are feeding on hope, lack of hope, low financial IQ. The most dangerous person in the world is a person with no hope. I'm going to get to the definition of poverty in just a moment. So what I'm going to do, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but in these so-called poor neighborhoods, I'm going to rob check cashers of their customers. We're going neighborhood by neighborhood and moving credit scores 120 points. I don't need legislation. I don't need protesting. I don't need picketing. I need raised credit scores. Because when your credit score changes, your attitude changes, your, your, your self-esteem changes, your perspective changes, because somebody who has a 670, 700 credit score will not accept Wait a minute, I'm going to give you my government-issued Social Security check so you, and pay you 5% to give me my own money back when there's no risk to the government check? Are you out of your mind? So check cashers will turn into credit unions and banks through market forces. Liquor stores will turn into convenience stores and grocery stores through market forces. Poor neighborhoods turn into emerging markets who pay taxes and who vote. I'm getting ahead of myself. Back to Ryan Taylor, the guy who made the suit. See, you thought you, I lost myself, see? <laughs> he, so he came back and, you know, you cannot grow without legitimate suffering. You cannot grow without legitimate suffering. Rainbows follow storms. My last book, the favorite, cha favorite chapter was Lost Creates Leaders. Nobody woke up, woke up in the morning and said, I want to start a cancer foundation. People who start cancer foundations are people whose lives have been impacted somehow by cancer. Rainbows after storms. So Ryan Taylor went through this process of not liking me but respecting me. And I tell you, I'd rather you respect me and not like me than like me and never respect me. And he learned to respect himself. He learned to listen to his own inner voice. He then got some knowledge, got some uplift, got some intelligence, got some entrepreneurship training. We then gave him a $35,000 loan for a startup of his business. He had to pay the first loan back. So love comes with responsibility. Ladies and gentlemen, the guy's doing between $800,000 and a million dollars a year in revenue. That was 10 years ago. He had six full-time employees. He's paying his taxes, raising his children, has started a nonprofit called Leap to Pay It Forward. That's $10 million in 10 years.
And I'm going to tell you in just a moment why that is the magic of America, that little story right there. That's the magic of America, and really it's where all of you came from and you don't even know it. Let me talk about the other poverty. You make $70,000 a year and live in New York City. You are struggling to make ends meet. Yes? You make $50,000 a year and live in Washington, D.C. You are struggling to make ends meet. You make uh, $40,000 a year and live in Atlanta, Georgia. You are struggling to make ends meet. You, live in, you make $25,000, $30,000 a year, live in a small town. You are struggling to make ends meet. Middle class used to be one parent working. It was blue collar, not white collar. The other parent stayed home as a domestic engineer and raised your children. Boy, you, I'm giving you guys good stuff. It's just going right over your head. <laughs> domestic engineer. Okay, anyway. Thank you. Wife or husband. Middle class today is two parents working. It's white collar, not blue collar, and you aren't making any more money. In fact, you feel like you've got too much month at the end of your money. <laughs> this delayed reaction just got me <laughs> all wound up. Here are the numbers. Here are the numbers. 70% of America, so this is the largest economy in the world. By the way, don't let anybody tell you that America's done. All this rhetoric about America's had its best times, it's a lie. This is only fear. It's fear. We're the largest economy on the planet. 16, 17 trillion dollars in GDP. There's only 300 million in, people in America. There are 7 billion people on the planet. We're this, this economic juggernaut, but we've lost our storyline. We've forgotten who we are. And we've been here before. We were told 25 years ago, remember this, Japan was going to just take us over. Remember this? Everybody going around learning Japanese. <laughs> they were buying everything. It was a foregone conclusion. We're done. Remember that? We're done. And then some young people who didn't read the reports that we were done, some young people who, didn't, who weren't cynical, who were not, who were not tired, who, who just woke up in the morning hungry with an idea, created Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all these companies in Silicon Valley, and we, brought, we pulled $10 trillion GDP out of our rear end like an idea and put it on the table. <laughs> And we surged. It was an idea. All a patent is is a monetized idea. That's all it is. So here are the numbers. We're the largest economy in the world. 70% of the US economy is consumer driven. Consumer driven. Buying, uh, I went to get some coffee with Warnock this morning. Buying some coffee. Paying fees to come here, stopping at the uh, gas station, getting, filling your gas tank, going to lunch, when you go to dinner tonight, buying that pen that you're writing with right there, but you're so pretty, somebody gave you the pen. Um, <laughs> paying car notes, paying house notes, paying rent statements, paying school fees. Small things is driving the largest, all these microtransactions, 70% of all of American GDP is consumer spending. Half of, America, half of Americans make $50,000 a year or less. Half. 90% of all of those dollars go back into the economy because people who make $50,000 a year or less cannot afford not to spend that money. Are you with me? So they are literally driving economic growth, the middle class, the, the working class, what I call the teetering class, the working poor are driving the largest economy on the planet. Okay, somebody, somebody, some, there's some cynic in the audience. Oh, it, this doesn't make any sense to me. What do you, okay, hold on. I'm on the board of a company, $75 billion. Sounds impressive. We own a bunch of companies. One of the companies we own is Neiman Marcus. It does well. Needless markup. <laughs> but are they the largest retailer in the world? No. Not even close. What's the largest retailer? Walmart which is designed for the working poor, the struggling class, the middle class, the teetering class. What's the second largest retailer? Target. I mean, I can go on for this forever. Look, let, let me get down real deep. Let me get down real deep. Everything that you use today that is, drive, that is driving the largest economy on the planet was created for the wealthy. Automobiles was originally a gift, a toy, a trinket for the wealthy. Then Ford came along and others, Packard has a house around here, then others and Tesla came around 
And Ford, though, reimagined the automobile, Dr. Franklin, and then paid his workers enough to buy, the, to buy the automobile they were making, and voila, you had a middle class. People are talking about a, a minimum wage. I don't, talk, no, I don't want a government-mandated middle class. I mean, a, a government-mandated minimum wage. I want a free market-inspired living wage. Because the more you make, the more you're going to spend. You're going to put it, wait a minute. If I can, all I can afford is, a, is, is rent and a mortgage payment and basic food, how am I going to go to the restaurant you just, you just opened? How am I going to buy the automobile that Ford needs me to buy every three years or lease it? How am I going to buy a refrigerator GE needs me to lease or buy every seven years? The big companies, when I tell my friend, rich people need poor people just to stay rich. <laughs> We're all in this thing. Let me, I, I'm, I'm here, I'm running out of time. So let me draw, I want to do some Q&A. Let me drive the rest of these statistics home. Please forgive me, I'm going through the rest of the numbers sort of quick. Are you just okay, by the way? You enjoying yourself? <laughs> So, so it's a lot of information to try to get in in 40, 40 minutes. But automobiles now are ubiquitous. And by the way, what was the wealthiest city in the world? Not in America. The wealthiest city in the world 55 years ago. Detroit. Very good. Of course, the biggest bankruptcy in America today in the world, in America, because they forgot their storyline. They began to believe they were important. They believed that they, that they were on the top of the hill. By the way, this is a little interesting factoid. The, the richest state. In America, in 1830, the richest state, you'll never guess it, let me just tell you, Mississippi. Wow. Richest by far, 1830. They were the Silicon Valley of America in 1830. I don't want to tell you what their product was. <laughs> That's why it didn't last. They are the poorest state in America today. They lost their storyline. Back to the, to the numbers. Automobiles. The least of these God's children got a hold of them and all boats rose, and companies got a shareholder value. Restaurants were once a toy for the rich. You now find restaurants in gas stations. Cell phones. I mean, when I had a cell phone, it was a 10-pound brick by Motorola. <laughs> it was like trying to get, carry around Dr. Franklin's wallet. It's just like. And, 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 and I don't know about you, but this, this, cell, this cell phone, it was, was $3,000. It was 45 cents a minute, and it didn't carry a, a, a line for like more than 10 seconds. <laughs> but it was cool. Today, Africa will probably be the first wireless continent. There are a billion people, and there are 700 million cell phones. People don't have running water in Africa, and they got cell phones. And where are the markets growing for cell phones? In Africa, in China, in Latin America. That's where the markets are exploding. That's not charity. That's not a handout. That's prosperity in sight. I can, I can go, you, toilets, toy for the rich. I mean, we can literally, everything you use, until the least of these God's children, until it became commoditized and available to everybody, it did not take off. Let me now bring this home, because I'm going to just short circuit through some of the statistics. I'm going to get to jobs. I, mean, I didn't define poverty. Let me do that very quickly. Define poverty, get to jobs, and then Q&A. Poverty. Is, everything you've been told about poverty in the last 50 years is wrong. We've been digging in the wrong holes. The government will say that poverty is $24,000 in change in income. That's technically correct. It, by government, it's technically correct. But then to use that technical definition and then go try to do a strategy to eradicate poverty against it, we're not human Doings were human beings. It's wrong. Here's poverty. Half of all poverty is lack of belief in yourself. It's just low self-esteem. If I don't like me, I'm not going to like you. If I don't feel good about me, I'm not going to feel good about you. If I don't respect me, you can't expect me to respect you. If I don't love me, I don't have a clue how to love you. And here's the big one. If I don't have a purpose in my life, I'm going to make your life a living hell. <laughs> Whatever goes around, comes around. Half of, half of poverty is I don't like me, I don't believe in me, and it communicates. The second part of poverty, role modeling. I've already touched on role modeling. I touched on why I am who I am. When I was nine years old, a banker came in my classroom and taught financial literacy. Now, in my neighborhood, nobody wore suits. This guy had a blue suit, red tie, white shirt. 
He happened to be Caucasian, didn't matter. I thought he was green, like currency. And <laughs> the second session, I asked him, I said, what do you do for a living? And how would you get rich legally? <laughs> I was serious. I mean, nobody in my neighborhood wore suits. He said, I'm a banker and I finance entrepreneurs. Ladies and gentlemen, I didn't know what an entrepreneur was, but I said, I'm going to be one. The next year, that was home economics, financial literacy course in my school. The next year, the, my, the endorphins in the right side of my brain kicking off. I'm excited about who I can be, what I can do. The next year, uh, I go to the liquor store. It sold candy in my neighborhood, Mr. Mac. Mr. Mac is selling wrong kind of candy. Go away, little boy. I've got a college degree. That's nice. I've got cavities. <laughs> I'm 10 years old. I'm telling you, you're selling the wrong kind of candy. Go away, little boy. I don't give up. He said, what do I need to get you to get off my back? Hire me. He hired me. What do you want to work? Front counter? No, no, no. I don't want to work. That's where the most money is. And I want to work in the back. The back? That's the worst. Sound. Yes, I want to work in the back. I worked there for three weeks and quit. I was a box boy. I wasn't trying to make it a career. I was trying to figure, figure out how he bought his stock, how much he paid for it, who was buying what, when. And I quit, went home, borrowed $40 from my mother, went to Iris Food Store. I know that's where it was on the side of the box where he bought his inventory. <laughs> I bought the stuff I knew that my friends would, would buy from me. I came home, set up the neighbor candy house in the den of my house, which was, had a better location. I was on the way to school. <laughs> I made $300 a week. <laughs> I put the liquor store out of the candy business. <laughs> I found girls, lost a business. It was a recurring theme of my life until I married Natasha. <laughs> OK, I'm basically an entrepreneur today because of that. Role modeling, environment. This is the second piece of a three-part plan. Environment. You hang around nine broke people, you'll be the tenth. Yeah. I don't have time for a long explanation, but you, hopefully you can get that. Oh, it, yeah. You model what you see. The third piece is aspiration. is a code word for hope and opportunity. If I don't have any opportunity, why am I going to go to school? Why even try? If there's no job, if there's no job at the end of this, what's the point? Kids are going to school want to see two things. An opportunity for a good job or an opportunity for economic uh, uh, advancement. If I can only see connect education with aspiration, I'm dropping out in middle school mentally and I'm dropping out physically in high school. The dropout rate in America is 30 to 70 percent. Now, again, I'm going to bring this home because I've sort of run out of time. But let me just give you one last aha. Have you enjoyed this? This is, this is how it makes me happy, it makes me, gives me hope for, for, for America and for the world. Okay, we think everything's screwed up. It's not. 1970, half of, 70% of all jobs came from big business. So that's what you thought, you were right. 4% of all jobs came from one company, AT&T. Today, here's where jobs come from. 300 million Americans in this country. Seventy percent of all jobs, 500 employees or less. Half of all jobs, half, 100 employees or less. Think about this. Where was your, you went to an architecture firm to design your house, five people. You went to the dentist, six people. You went to a hair salon, eight people. You went to a restaurant, 15 people. You went to a, I mean, think about it. You went to your accountant, 15 people, max. There are 974 businesses in America that employ 10,000 people or more. And you can, and you can name them, GE, uh, help me out, Google, uh, IBM, Walmart, Bank of America. I mean, it's not hard. Here's what we tell our kids. Go to school, K through 12, graduate, go to college, get a degree, go work for a big company or government who are not hiring. Here's what it saved America. You need startup, small business owners, entrepreneurs who create all jobs year three through year seven. For the first time since 1978, we've got more small business deaths in America than small business births. First time since 1978. There are 350,000 births in 2011 and 400,000 small business deaths. All you need to do to save America is a million startups a year. Where are the startups going to come from? Small businesses, entrepreneurs, who has this kind of time on their hand? Who can reimagine themselves? The poor, the working class, the struggling class, those who are at the bottom. Every big business is once a small one. Ladies and gentlemen, I. I'm done, but I'm going to just tell you something. I believe in America, and I believe that we can get this right, and I believe we can deliver a memo to a new generation and teach them the language of money, 
and teach them about free enterprise and capitalism and teach them about ownership and teach them about, teach them about opportunity and get the, the right side of the brain to fire the endorphins about their hope, their opportunity, their aspiration. And if you have any doubts about the so-called poor, let me tell you this about even the worst example, drug dealers. Drug dealers are immoral, they are unethical, they need to pay, they need to pay a special death, a special debt to society, and there's a special place in hell for somebody who sells death to their own community. But if you are a successful drug dealer, one thing you are not is dumb. You understand import, export, finance, marketing, wholesale, retail, customer service, security, territory, these are not dumb people, they're misdirected people. I'm here to talk to you about sparking a movement, ladies and gentlemen. The book, How the Poor Can Save Capitalism, is not a book about complaints. At the end of this book are 20 examples of what you can do, what everybody can do to change America. What I'm going to do is to create America's first national private banker for the working poor. Think about the Starbucks for financial inclusion. A thousand locations within spitting distance of every working class family in this country. And I'm going to give them credit counseling and financial planning. And I'm going to give them the earning them tax credit. We'll talk about that maybe in the q and I'm going to raise credit scores to 700. And I'm going to help to set people free. And for anybody who believes I'm dreaming, we already have 100 locations in 250 days. God bless you. John Hope Bryant, you've been a gift to Chautauqua, and you've contributed to the intellectual richness of this week focused on economic justice for all. You've brought to us a different perspective, and you see the enthusiasm with which you've been received. We now have about 15 minutes for Q&A, and our practice at Chautauqua is to ask uh, those who wish to raise a question or make a very brief comment no speeches, as Joan Brown Campbell would say. No speech. We've heard the speech. Please line up at either microphone, and John, you can acknowledge the uh, inquisitors uh, in alternating fashion. Thank you. Am I signing books afterwards? Or yes. Is that, okay, okay, all right. okay. Okay, do you think payday lending should be illegal? And uh, if you don't think that, why not? This is a free country. I do not think payday lending should be illegal. There is a good reason for, I mean, most things in moderation have a purpose. Alcohol in moderation will lower your blood pressure. <laughs> Drugs in moderation are actually prescribed. There are a lot of things in moderation, like me in moderation, you actually can tolerate. <laughs> <laughs> um, payday lending was actually created for a good purpose. You, you know, you, you have this population living from paycheck to paycheck, which is 70% of America, by the way, they hit a bump in the road. They have a death in the family. They have Johnny get sick. It has to go to the doctor. They don't have medical insurance. Um, there's a car repair. God forbid they lose their job. They need a bridge over troubled waters. Temporary. They go to the payday lender one time. That was the purpose for it. But when you're dealing with people who've got low self-esteem, who, there are reasons why liquor stores are right next to the check cashers. They're feeding on spiritual poverty. So these people, they don't believe there's a tomorrow. And they get into this cycle. By the way, if you take out a payday loan more than six times, the compounding of that makes it almost impossible for you to, to pay it back with a normal pay check uh, with the compounding of interest. So, it's become a predatory industry because of the intention of those behind it. Uh, so I don't think that the industry should be outlawed. I think we need to empower people to know better so they do better, to give them the tools to compete in a, cap, a free enterprise society, to give them the, the, the self-esteem and the guideposts to know better so they can then, I mean, I would never take a subprime loan as an example. Um, but I think that very educated people who have college degrees went and got 
a subprime loan because they asked what was the payment, not what was the interest rate. You never ask what the payment is when there's an interest rate attached. So, so I, I, I just think that that's not the answer. Out, outlawing them is just not, not the answer. There are some that need to be put in jail, but the industry shouldn't be outlawed. Thank you. Hi, I'm talking about predatory lending, and uh, it's a good follow-on. Um, people who struggle to pay for housing, struggle to pay utilities. Um, young people starting out are struggling to pay their student loans. Great. Do you have any yeah. thoughts about that? Yeah, don't do it. So <laughs> if, you, if you go into $200,000 worth of student loan debt, that's your mortgage. You aren't going to get a house. That's your mortgage payment. So. Look, we are using an old model in a new economy. In my book, I talk about this guy, Eric. Eric came to my office and was writing some notary documents. I was notarizing some documents, and my overly simplistic, sometimes uh, uh, presumptuous self said to Eric, you must be a teacher, and this is, you're doing this as a part-time job, and isn't this sweet? This must, you know, you're making a few, but you doing okay with this? Oh, I'm doing okay. So is this a part-time job? No, no, I do it full-time. You know, so I kept on digging my own hole. And he finally says, look, let me, I do it full time. Uh, I make $17,000 a month. Well, slow down. What? I got a $36 notary stamp from the city of Atlanta. I saw a hole in the marketplace. I got a bunch of other people who, were, uh, who didn't have uh, employment and gave them extension to my license. They do mobile, no mobile notary too. I make $17,000 a month with 200 contractors. And then I started a little insurance business that also allows people to do bindy, binderies when you go to buy a car at night and the insurance office is not open. He issues temporary binders for those who go to buy a car. That's another $10,000 a month. The guy's making $30,000 a month and he has no, 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 no four-year uh, degree. But, you know, you can be driving down the road in your nice Mercedes, Mercedes, Mercedes payments and have a, a tow-up plumbing truck next to you. The guy in the plumbing truck may be worth more. Electricians, plumbers, notaries, uh, teachers' aid, I mean, uh, nurses' aides. There's a lot of business, one year certification, and you could be making $80,000 a year. I think we need to reimagine, reimagine how we create an economy. It's not all a four year degree at, a, at an Ivy League college with $200,000 worth of debt. We need a bunch of folks to go out and become entrepreneurs and small business owners. Look, I got honorary doctorate degrees, Harvard gave me a degree. And I got a GED out of high school, which Chris Rock called a good enough diploma. <laughs> That's a great transition. Many of us may have been here last year when Father Greg Boyle spoke about his home work at Homeboy Industries. Yeah. I am on the board of a reentry program and spend time in the Arlington County Jail. So one of the challenges that we have with the fellows I work with is helping them think about businesses that they can start. We have tried with florists, we have tried helping these guys with food trucks, that sort of things. Do you have suggestions for entrepreneurial ventures that are kind of businesses in a box that we can get going on? Yes! <laughs> so, so we have this thing called Hope Business in a Box Aren't Academy. You, you can go, on the, go to Project 5117, just Google search, it'll come right up. I have 25 businesses that a young person can start for $500 or less. All right. We go into high schools and middle schools. We do a, a, a course in dignity, which is values, a course in financial literacy, the language of money, a course in entrepreneurship. 25 businesses you can start for $500 or less. Tell the kids to pick one. We do a pitch event in the kids' auditorium. Think Shark Tank for kids. The kid gets two minutes to pitch their idea, raises their confidence level. Great. When they win, we fund the business up to $500, assign a business role model to them. They can only get the money if they open a bank account. Okay. So we create a bank account. And then that creates economic energy and focus in the young people. And by the way, we're not even trying to create entrepreneurs. We're trying to create leaders. Right. Because when you've got an entrepreneurial mindset, a can-do mindset, you, go around, you start, to learn, start to learn to go around problems, through problems, over problems. You start taking no for vitamins. You have a sense of belief in yourself, which is really the real poverty. So we're doing the same thing now for adults in our Hope Inside locations. We've got 25 businesses you can start for $1,000 or less. Some of them are in the book. Okay. Let me give you one quick example of how changing your mind. I love what you're doing. It's God's work. Um, young guy named Derek. It's in the, the story's in the book. Derek in Detroit went through the financial literacy course. The kids were all teasing Derek. Man, why are you hanging around with these people? It suits on. And, uh, so we're going down the hallway. Derek's graduated from the course. Young guys come teasing him. Man, why are you hanging around those people? That ain't about nothing. 
I go in to defend Derek's honor, two of his friends said, look, I'm going to give each of you $70, make a decision about Nike. The other two friends said, I want some Air Jordans. You need another 30 bucks. <laughs> Derek said, I want to buy one share in Nike stock, which was 64 bucks at the time. The friends jump on Derek. Not physically, worse, mentally, spiritually, emotionally. Man, why you want to buy those shoes? That, I mean, why you want to buy that? That ain't nothing. You need to get you some Air Jordan. Everybody in school has got Air Jordan. Purple Air Jordans, leather Air Jordans, fuchsia Air Jordans, striped Air Jordans. Everybody's got Air You need to get you some Air Jordans. I go to defend Derek's honor. Now, he's gone through this program now. Derek says, I said, you okay? No, I'm cool. I want them to buy those shoes. Derek will never be poor again. He might be broke, but he'll never be poor again. Thank you for your talk. And I, I'm sure you've gone, run through your mind that there's probably an anti-capitalist in the crowd. Bring it um, on. <clears throat> I love it. <laughs> so I was just wondering, um, can you talk about the kind of in, uh, unsustainable nature of capitalism in terms of the environment? Like, I don't know if you, how you can be a, an earth lover, an environmentalist, and at the same time telling people to buy more, and uh, I just think that they're inco incompatible. Uh, you're right. So, so let, me, let me start with a couple of truths. I love I've been waiting for this question for like a month. So, <laughs> so, so, so first of all, we have made a mistake. We have taken our uh, society and put it in in, in, inside of our economy versus putting our economy inside of our society. So capitalism actually needs an upgrade. It needs a software upgrade, a massive one. Look, you've got 3.5 billion people on the planet who don't have as much wealth as the, as the richest 85 people on the planet. That's unsustainable. And the wealthy know it's unsustainable. They actually like my book. <laughs> so, so, so let me now go to the, your core question. Capitalism is a horrible system. Democracy is a horrible system except for every other system. <laughs> There's a communist country called China that picked capitalism. There's another communist country, like less good communism, Russia, that actually picked capitalism. It's amazing to me. People who actually are capitalists are like picking capitalism. I mean, or communists picking capitalism. It is a horrible system except for every, some of you, oh, America's a horrible country. Okay, you just tell me the perfect one, I'll wait. <laughs> and they never have an answer. My friends who come to me, oh, I, I hate capitalism. I, and, you know, my Occupy Wall Street friends. And I, okay, look, first of all, you guys had a moment. Occupy Wall Street, you got a great message, you're right. You had a moment. The problem was, I'm angry at you because you're only angry. You got to figure out what you're for. Not what you, Dr. King was an optimist. He was about what he was for. He was the only black leader talking to white America. He was about redeeming the soul of America from the, from the triple evils of war, racism, and poverty. He was about bringing all of us uh, together. So my Occupy Wall Street friends, first of all, there weren't a plan of where we go. They just hated where we came from. Number two, I said, wait a minute, how'd you get here? We were in a car, we carpooled. Okay. <laughs> that car might have a car note on it. Where'd you stay like? Oh, no, we, we stayed together in an apartment. Okay, that apartment, you pay rent on the apartment? You probably, you know, there's probably an investor that owns that apartment, and he's probably paying some fin interest rate on the financing. You know, that's capitalism, the car and the apartment. Okay, you're picketing. Well, that, those, okay, you know, the, the picket signs. Oh, we got them a small business. You know that's free enterprise and capitalism, don't you? So, <laughs> so here's what I tell them. Unless you want to move to the Sudan or Haiti, this is all you got. <laughs> We got to, nothing's perfect. Nothing's perfect. What we have to try to do is strike a balance and to make, make sure that the system works, does more, har more good than harm, like three or four to one, and make sure that the least of these God's children get a shot at a life that's better. And, and, and when you have people who have the, be the good intentions, they actually want to pay their people more. They actually want a sustainable environment. They actually want a place that's around in 100 years. America's economic crisis is not an economic crisis. It's a crisis of virtues and values. Thanks a lot.
Come on, bring it on. <laughs> this is an easier question for you. Um, you have inspired me to, uh, when I go back home, look at a program that I'm creating. So I have been challenged with creating 14 moms between the ages of 15 and 21, a program for them. A piece of that is what I thought before I came to this was, you know, teaching them how to open up a bank account, financial literacy. So where do you, where will I get my biggest bang for my bucks? What is it that I need to teach them that will make the biggest impact on these women's lives? If you want to put a kid to sleep, give them a traditional financial literacy course. I don't want to do that. Or tell them to eat their vitamins or, the, 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 you know, eat your vegetables yeah. or something. Nobody, thanks for the question. Okay. Nobody wants a, a mortgage. Nobody, oh, give me a subprime 20% interest mortgage. I can't, I can't wait to get one of those. <laughs> no, they want to become a homeowner. The mortgage is the vehicle. It's their aspirations. Nobody wants a car loan. They want a cool car. Mm -hmm. the, the, the car loans, the vehicle. Nobody wants a bank account. <laughs> Nobody right. wants to be told, go get your good grades. These kids want to be rich, famous, aspirational, successful. You've got to connect education with aspiration. And the reason kids are dropping out of school at by the way, the best number we got in America is 30%. 30% of all of your kids, wherever you live in America, are dropping out in the richest country on the planet. We don't fix that, we're done. 30 million kids, fourth grade through 12th grade, that's the bench strength for the playoff games and the rest of your life. You don't want to do anything else, go into a school and role model these kids and give them a business internship, it will change the world. 70% of black men are dropping out of school in the richest country in the world. That means the end of the black family. Because who's my daughter going to marry? So, I mean, this is not, this is like game over if we don't fix this. And all these students are are customers. Mm -hmm. And the school is a business. And the customer is rejecting the product. Right. <laughs> and so we want to blame the, we want to, <laughs> this, this is crazy to me. You want to blame the customer. Mm -hmm. No, no. You need to connect education with aspiration and show kids if you go to school, you'll do better. Mm -hmm. So Hope Business the Box Academy, or 4-H, or Junior Achievement, or something that speaks to what these, that lights them up. A kid who wants to go be a football player will get that C plus, or whatever that minimum is, so they can play football. We need to do the same thing for economic aspiration, and I'm, I'm, you're, just, you're that close to it. I'll give you some free software after this. I'll give you my card to connect it all together. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> yep, thank you. I was very interested in your statement right at the end of rolling out banks, yeah. small banks, yeah. into, the, into the communities, which, by the way, is, I believe, the way that Bank of America started, with an Italian immigrant who couldn't get loans for Italians. He said, by God, I'm going to do it myself. Bank of Italy. Yeah, that's right. Now, do you run into competition uh, pushback from the established banks, and do you run into any kind of regulatory problems when you're doing this? So I'm really practical. <laughs> uh, I believe when you're being run out of town, get in front of a crowd, make like a parade. <laughs> so I don't, want, I don't want to be a bank. I want to be a banker. I want to be the private banker to the poor, the working class, and the teetering class. So we actually operate our hope inside, hold on, inside of bank branches. You'll find us in SunTrust banks, Regions banks, PNC bank, Union bank, Bank of the West. All, and then I'm going to go into grocery stores. Then I'm going to go into credit unions. I'm going to go into big box retailers. You know when you walk in the Target, you see Starbucks on the right? I'm going I'm to be your Starbucks. So, so when, one of the things I found is that the problem went from the poor to the middle class, but the middle class folks did not want to come into a Hope Center because that's where poor people went. It was shame. They don't mind coming into a bank branch. The problem they have is the bank branch is in the no business. The problem the bank branch has is that they're in the no business. There's 100,000 bank branches in America, and their problem is they need a new mission because the new bank branch is this. The minute that, a, that the bank started accepting a deposit on my cell phone, it was over. I, there's no reason for me to go on a bank branch ever again. So now I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm driving traffic into the bank branch. SunTrust CEO came to me, called me one day. He went into one of our Hope Inside, one of his Hope Inside locations. He was owning it, and said to me, he was expecting 100 people to come in in 90 days that hadn't been there before because we were inside. He said it's 4x. 450 people came into his bank branch because we were there. 
that hadn't been there before. And we were driving credit scores up, so we're creating sustainable customers for him. So now the regulators like him, the community likes him. And by the way, if you come in there looking for a $3,000 loan, you, you were in trouble before you got there. You don't need a three, if you need a $3,000 loan, you're going to need lo another loan after that. The bank's going to turn you down for a $3,000 loan, right? I'm going to say, no, no. Do you make $50,000 a year or, yes, or less? Yes, I make $28,000. What do you do? I'm a teacher. I have two children. Okay. Do you ever heard of EITC? No. That means that you're qualified for three years of retroactive payments. If you make $28,000 a year and you have two children and you work, the governor owes you $4,000 in a tax credit for working. It's not a handout. It's a credit for working. If you haven't filed once, it's retroactive three years. That's $12,000. That's more money than a working family would see at any time in their natural born life. And, we, and poor people send one, one out of four poor people who qualify for EITC, never ask for it. We send $10 billion back to the federal government every year because poor people never ask for their own money. Just imagine how popular banks are going to be when we start giving people EITC payments in bank branches instead of a loan. So we're going to turn it and flip it on its head. And I don't pay rent, I don't pay utility bills, which means that more of the money that I bring in goes directly to helping people. Hello, come on now, talk to me. Okay. I want to follow up with the uh, question that the lady before me had, and that's helping out students. Uh, I participate in an inner city high school, and the question is, you can't make it to every high school, Software is nice, but how do we actually motivate these young students to do something that we're not able to motivate them to do? So, uh, great question, but actually you underestimate yourself. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, only had 70 employees. His whole budget was $600,000 for the whole movement. He changed the world, did it without firing a shot, went up against the most powerful nation in the world. He did it with the power of an idea and what I call a ripple effect. Remember I said that 5% number? 5% of role models will stabilize any neighborhood. So, if I could, so I'm going to have 2,000 whole business to box academies in the toughest schools in America. Do you know that half of all dropouts come from 1,800 schools? The dropout factories. It's a culture of dropout. Most murders come in, in certain concentrated zip codes. By the way, most wealth comes from certain concentrated zip codes. It's a culture of wealth. It's a culture of poverty. It's a culture of... So, so you can create a culture. I can't physically eradicate poverty, but I can spiritually inspire a different way to think and approach so that you at least own yourself. And that can be, and I'm doing it financially. I'm doing it through the little mechanism I created through Hope Business Box Academies. That's 2,000 locations, and then 1,000 Hope Inside locations, and then 5,000 Hope Inside Plus where I actually train and certify the banker in my way of thinking. And then I've got a software platform where I give you open source software for free to just take in your community and do it on your own. But then hopefully I just inspire you to rip off my idea and find your own way to do this in culture, in art, in athletics, uh, in, in other, other ways that you're really basically inspiring people to take their own life back. And that's when you have a movement. And that's what, that actually is sustainable. And you can do that by 2020. John Hope Bryant, I hate to stop this. We appreciate it. We are so grateful. Please join us at the Hall of Missions, his book, his further advice. Thank you very much.